Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 385. I'm your host, Lauren Gray, and may I wish all of you happy holidays. That includes currently everyone that is celebrating uh, Hanukkah, those that are in eager anticipation of Christmas this Sunday, uh, those that are doing Kwanzaa, uh, and of course, for the rest of us, it's the Festivus. And I hope that you have an enjoyable evening of sharing and, and, and venting grievances tonight. <laughs> At least I think it's tonight. Any which way, it is that holiday season. We are wrapping up 2022 in many ways, yay. In other ways, whoa. Um, it has been a year of transition from uh, all of us in many, many ways, especially for marketing for hospitality uh, in, in the divergence of things that have changed and the things that we use and going into a 2023 with a pessimistic optimism, which is supposed to not go together. But apparently uh, there is this this cautious optimism of 2023 in a more normal sense, normal being pre-COVID as to what's going on. However, we keep finding new ways to scare ourselves with so much that is going on in the world, both politically and um, socially, and of course, medically and so forth with uh, the tridemic kind of perspective of things going on right now. Right now, it's a cold winter blast to all of the Northeast. For those of us that l listen to the show from around the world, you may not be experiencing that kind of dramatic weather, or you might be facing worse in different ways. But uh, to all of us, we're bonded by the idea that we are in the hospitality industry. And in this particular case for our show, it is about marketing. I did pick up an interesting, weird topic. And this is out of an inspiration of coming to <clears throat> a conclusion of perspective. And this goes back to my history of when I used to operate at hotels and run hotels and so forth and move up into corporate offices and what have you, is that you create biases, uh, whether you intentionally do it or willfully do it, uh, you create abbreviated ways to perceive people and in, 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 in the shorter that you get exposed to. And we do this as humans on everything. Um, it's one of the reasons why we do things. We've talked about this on the show and in presentations that I do that um, as an industry, we try to classify people. It's easier for us to understand conceptually people in similarity <clears throat> than in the uniqueness of their individuality. Now we strive to be able to communicate individually, but we categorize our communication, our, our marketing, um, in, 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 a, in a group sense. And no better representation of that is our reference to Smurf markets. And as I like to joke when I refer to that, unless a very small blue person shows up in front desk, there's no such thing as a Smurf. However, we categorize our business, group business, under the acronym of Smurf, social, military, educational, fraternal. Weddings are a great example of Smurf. Um, and we treat them differently according to what type of business they represent. For instance, weddings, when you're dealing with group sales for weddings, it's a very engaging one-on-one -on -one dialogue. What are their favorite colors? What do they envision? What is the feel of what they want to do? What is their favorite flowers? There's a lot more dialogue about the progression of discovery with a wedding event than there is a business or corporate event. Um, what breakouts? How many people? How do you want to splinter this up? What transition to the room you want to have? There's lots of different conversations. And our best way to assimilate how we dialogue with these people is we initiate conversations based on the categories of things that we know we're going to talk to them about. For instance, a wedding form on a website would have the kind of conversational questions that you would ask in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue of flowers and colors and size of group of people and so forth. There are some similarities to other group activities, but there's a lot of individual uniqueness about the wedding conversation. And then corporate, you're talking about, you know, uh, room configuration, chevrons, rounds, you know, classroom, whatever, breakouts, uh, breakout rooms, uh, break periods, so forth and so on. So you get the idea. So we categorize people like that so that we have a starting point so that there's a, a place rather than a blank slate that says, I have no idea what you, you know, are you one person coming in, checking in because you're a transient traveler? Or are you representing hundreds of people that are going to show up behind you because of a group event? We try to do as much preliminary understanding so that we don't step on the wrong foot. With that being said, uh, having worked through the ranks of through food and beverage and hotels, as I mentioned before, and restaurants and what have you, and then into hotels and going through and running operating hotels and brands and unbrands and everything, and I'm not trying to get my history so much as I'm trying to say, you begin to try to short circuit the many engagements that you have by perceiving people in a way that makes sense to you, to know how to not get on the wrong foot talking with them. They, they, you, you see them a certain way. We stereotype. It's a terrible thing to say, but we do tend to categorize people. We do that as humans to everybody. 
how they dress, how they talk, their mannerisms, any information about where they came from, their upbringing, their age, all the things we use to identify people for marketing is the same things we identify to categorize them to know what we're going to speak to them about. Uh, if you ever doubt this, then see if you talk to a, a five-year-old the same as you do a 50-year-old. And it's not a gender issue, it's an age issue at that point. By the same token, if you're speaking to a female versus a male, depending upon their age and depending upon your status in life, your conversational tone changes as well. We do this inherently as a part of our human nature. Why am I bringing all this up? Because unfortunately, and this is just something I've recently begun to understand of way I've, I saw people in a certain way, is that there is a kind of polarity and progression of, of people that are responsible uh, managers, uh, basically executive level people at hotels. And my title for today's topic, very long-winded in discussion with all this process, is how to stop be being... Uh, how, to stop, how to stop using condo management style. And if you just read it from the title perspective, you have no reference point of what this is intentionally because you're thinking, why are you picking on condo management? What's wrong with condo management? Nothing's wrong with condo management. It's a perspective of condo management that I've come to equate with why I never really classified how I saw two types of people. Let me explain the people that I'm talking about. Um, when I went to a hotel from a corporate perspective, and I met the executive team. When it came to the discussion of marketing, which is usually my forte of discussion with the, the hotels, there was an immediate which side of the fence they landed on. I never defined it back then, but I knew which the, what, what it meant to be on either side of the fence. There's the fence that is very much about the awareness of drawing business into the hotel, that their role as leaders of the hotel expanded beyond the logistic functionality of the business itself into the realm of how do we capture, gather, and generate top-line revenue. They were aware of their engagement to that. They wanted to know about marketing. They wanted to, they planned for marketing. They strategized about marketing. They, they, they considered it as a part of their fundamental daily function was to engage with, that's great, what else are we doing about getting more of these people in? Now, from a sales team, it usually involved a director of sales, DOS, a lot more than not, uh, the GM, uh, was that other person that was very much about it. But I could also see it trickle down into the entire executive team that their F&B director was very much aware of what they can do to think of ways to do more business. And their catering manager. And even the housekeepers are saying, we did this or we do this to try to engage people when they're at the hotel to improve their chance of recurability of them coming back to the hotel. There was a sense of that, that awareness that they have this connection to what's going on out in the world to generate business. Then you had the other people. And this is no detriment to them. They were excellent property managers. They were very much worried about the logistics of the, the hotel. Their focus was all about the operation of the hotel. These people were studious about proper staffing at the front desk, proper maintenance schedules, proper cleanliness of the rooms, proper food preparation, proper um painting, maintenance, everything, ff and &E improvements and so forth, very much about budgets and, and, and functionality and the generation of the operation of the business. And everything outside of that was the realm of somebody else. Again, they weren't bad at their jobs at all, but they were very focused on that. And that's where just recently I started thinking about this because I've had to deal with a variety of people like that recently. And I kind of hit upon the fact that that's very much like condo management. And what I mean by condo management is if you ever get on, if you ever live in a condo or, or an association of that size and you get on the board, there is an immediate understanding of the parameters of your responsibilities. Everything outside the walls has something to do with the condo association, the community at large, uh, the common areas, the common functions, the things that everyone uses, all of those things, walls out is the perspective, okay? That awareness of everything that did. Now, everything walls in is not the responsibility of the association. And where associations tend to get in problems is they start trying to influence what goes walls in, or, or, they, or what's worse is the owners try to influence the association to be a part of walls in. Um, though there's a very definitive line contractually and legally that has the associations handling what's outside the walls and the ownership of the individual units worry about what's inside the walls. And it dawned on me that that's kind of how I saw these two types of people in hospitality. You had the first group of people that I mentioned were aware of what's outside. They handled the entire perspective 
of what marketing meant to their business. That it wasn't just about operating the hotel. It wasn't just about proper staffing, proper FF&E, proper maintenances, proper uh, cleanliness, and so forth. Those were all baseline things that always are part of their responsibilities. The ship shapeness of the ship, so to speak. But it was also the uh, awakened awareness that they had a part to play, if not a leadership part to play, in the process of discovering the revenue that made the machine run. And that's the part that I'm talking about for our topic today. The, the, the idea that there's a transition point. Some don't make it. Some don't do it. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to. There are many operations that are totally focused on the way that they control and manage the management teams and so forth, that they literally draw that line and say, you're only worried about walls in. Your whole responsibility to our organization relationship is to maintain everything that we're telling you you're responsible for in the operation of the business. Don't worry about the outside. We don't really need or want your engagement with it. That's us. We do that. Those businesses exist. And I'm not saying that's the best modality because there's a lot of lost opportunities not engaging the property with its ability to improve its marketing strategy. I've been on very many uncomfortable conversations when, as we often say, money covers a multitude of sins. And when the money's flowing, everybody thinks that they made the best decisions in the world. Having the team focus just on walls in, so to speak, uh, and maintaining all the things that the operation does and their bonuses are based on it and their performance metrics are based on it and their salary increases are based on it. Everything is based on them focusing on just walls in. And if, if the money's flowing, everything's great until the money stops flowing. And then you have the walls in management going, guys, uh, I can't cut anymore without cutting deeper. I can't, I, I'm gonna have to let people go that I don't wanna let go. I'm gonna have to not do certain things because there's just no money in my bank account. Um, I'm taking care of what I'm responsible for. I'm yielding as best I can. And as I often like to say, you can't cost save into profitability. Uh, it just is what you have to gen revenue to make that profitable. Uh, you cost save to maintain profitability, but you don't cost save to get into profitability. And so they begin to get bitter because they can't influence their destiny. They can't, they're, they're out of the picture. Their walls in, they have nothing to do with marketing, they have not been engaged with marketing, they have no engage, ability to engage with marketing. Um, they're left to whatever business comes their way based on the responsibility of other people, walls out, that are driving the business. What I've just painted is a very brand-esque relationship that brands create this paradox. And that is that they simplify the, the functions to the point that they only need people to handle walls in. I only want you to run the business. That's the part I can't do. I can't show up at 7 a.m., 6 a.m. I can't cover a night order shift. I can't cover a service shift. I can't hire people locally to get all the shifts filled. I can't paint the walls that I need to paint or clean the rooms I need to clean. That's your responsibility to maintain all of that. And I'll take care of the rest. That's a very brand -esque perspective. The problem is, and this is what COVID shown us when we did the first lockdown, is that brand bails on that. Uh, they furloughed everybody that was supposed to be responsible for driving business. Whatever excuse it was, there was no business to be had. There was no business to drive. There was no expense, you know, batting down the hatch to save the money, keep it in the bank account. I'm not faulting some of the strategic decisions made to do that. It was a function of business existence. What I'm faulting is, is the fact that it left so many properties that didn't have that exact same circumstance, that didn't have the restriction that they couldn't do business, but they had no modality to generate business. And they had nobody on the team that had the capabilities of generating business because they were excluded from those conversations. They were precluded from any engagement with those things. Brand did not even allow them to modify their websites. Brand didn't allow them to do any marketing. Brand didn't allow them to do any sort of promotions. And even if they did and they were supposed to go back to brand to generate them, there was nobody on the other side of the phone. That's the risk you run with that walls in, walls out and running it while it just walls in. For the pro properties that had team members, that were uh, engaged with the probability of generating business and the fortitude to know that they could influence what their business was doing. They found means to work around the obstacles that they had from that brand relationship. They, they leaned on social media to communicate and share content. They were able to reach out and say that even though we can't do these promotional codes the way you, you're familiar, we can offer you to communicate with us and we can work out a relationship, a price, a deal, whatever, uh, by communicating with us directly. 
they found ways to get in front of the people and influence the marketing. Now, I gave you the bad Brad example. I also give you the bad management example. There are management companies that don't want uh, an active engaged property to be a part outside of the walls. They really want to maintain the control factor of everything outside of what they have to show up on the doorstep and actually do. Um, there's plenty of management companies that go and say, we'll provide resources, we'll provide the marketing, we'll provide the revenue management, we'll provide all the stuff that is worrisome about generating revenue and maintaining a profitable business for you. You worry about running the business that we will make the profit from. Um, and that creates its scenarios, just like we described with uh, the pandemic lockdown and brand. You had hotels that couldn't and wouldn't or shouldn't and didn't or weren't allowed to influence their business. And then the management company may have done their own furloughs and cutbacks and what have you, or may have just battened up that they're not doing anything because they don't want to spend the money to do it for their own corporate integrity, you know, durability, survivability. And the hotel was left to flounder and a lot of them closed. We know that. Uh, they didn't have the ability to make business. And I'm not blaming this entirely. The hotel closing was because of the, this management style, but it did exacerbate the situations uh, when this was the case for hotels that didn't have any way of influencing their own business. Um, there are pluses to running just walls in. There's a certain focus and a certain growth for your management team. It doesn't overwhelm them. It keeps them in the world of familiar. It keeps it very much in front of them. This is my shift. This is my crew. This is my division, my department, whatever. And it allows them to grow and mature as managers then into leaders. And then you want them to blossom into a larger perspective, to go beyond just walls in and realize that they need now to take the skills that they've learned about walls in and make it a part of how they run a business. Um, and this is not just endemic to hospitality. Other businesses face the same scenario. You have excellent team leaders, excellent property manager logistics people, but they are not um, good at beyond that. They're not out into the free thinking of what's outside these walls. Some don't want to. Um, I think I keep, uh, I mentioned this tragic story before so many times. I was running a hotel. I came from food and beverage. I was running the hotel's GM and I needed a, to replace my restaurant manager. I moved up to a food and beverage director and there was an absolutely outstanding server. She was phenomenal. Mostly ran the restaurant when she was there because she was so good at being a good server. And I approached her about the fact I wanted to make her the restaurant manager. And at the time I was too blunted to see the lack of interest. I was thinking this was the greatest thing since I spread. I, I implied my values of growth and a constant escalation of responsibilities to her thinking that this would be something she would want. She's done so well at her current job that she wants the role of running the whole place. Cause heck she already pretty much does. She was the authority when she was there. I'm just giving you the title and the compensation to do it. And even though she wasn't overwhelmed with it, she, not to disappoint me, took the role. Sadly, I had to let her go less than 60 days afterwards. Because what I did do was take an absolutely excellent server who thoroughly enjoyed what she did and put her into her miserable circumstance to become the person she didn't want to be and took her off the floor of what she did the best and put her in a, in a role to fail. And that lesson to me, that destruction of who she was for what I, I was working with her on, is, is, is a mark that goes with me because I remember how ignorant I was that I would push somebody into that role thinking and implying everything I thought that they wanted to do without asking. And there are people that are walls in people. They are perfectly happy and perfectly capable and absolutely excellent at running a hotel logistically and have no good interest looking outside the walls. They want others to handle it. They enjoy their job for what they do. And those people are, are precious. You want those people because they're dedicated, they're capable, they're talented. Uh, you can't throw enough money at them. And it's, money isn't the real motivator. It's the success of what they do for what they're interested in doing. So I'm not condemning the walls in, walls out. I'm just saying that in a progression of people that want to expand into our industry, they go beyond the hotel that they just ran into a bigger hotel that they now run into a bigger hotel after that, that they run in comparison. Okay. Then you need to go do this transition of walls in, walls out. You need to go from what's in front of me to what's outside it. What is it that I can draw in? And it's not for everyone. Again, there are people that are excellent at running walls in. 
it's for the people that want to do the difference. Now, for me, I actually transitioned from running and doing and walls in and walls out and then eventually transitioned to being the person that's all about being outside, uh, all about finding the business and generating the business and cultivating. And that's the corporate perspective is what can I do to influence the businesses of the properties that I'm responsible for? So the idea of working with your team, the lesson out of this conversation, I hope that you take is to evaluate clearly the talent potential of your current management leadership teams. Find out where their interests are by asking. Engage them with what their perspective is of what they're doing. Engage them with their perspective of what they would like to be engaged in a part of. Do they have a natural interest in things beyond what they're currently responsible for? Do they ask questions beyond the scope of their current job title? Solicit that from people. They may feel that they don't have a right or an ability to bring it up in conversation yet. So you solicit the conversation so that they feel comfortable about talking about those things. See what their aspirations are beyond the diatribe of pleasing you as, as, as a, for an answer. Like, oh, yes, I always want to grow in this company. I, I want to be a valuable asset. Just like we say on my, on my resume and CV is I want to find a company that I can grow and become show all my potential and bring, contribute to, blah, blah, blah. Get past the, 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 the buzz and talk to them. What interests them? Some people don't like marketing. They, they find that it's better to leave it to somebody else that is interested in it than them, but they're fascinated with revenue management or they're fascinated with, with sales or they're fascinated with the operations from a multi-unit perspective. There's so many different perspectives that are walls out that uh, people can be interested in. It's not a dedication to you have to be like this or have to be in marketing to do this. It's all about tailoring your resources of your personnel, your most precious resource, more so than your brick and mortar. Uh, brick and mortar, you see, gets torn down and sold for scrap every day. And uh, being here with what happened with, e, with uh, Ian and everything else is, is a testament to that. Beautiful buildings that were multi-million dollar buildings are now just piles of rubble. Uh, the people and what made those places. Uh, that's the constant theme with what people talk about when they lose a business is the culture, the people. Uh, it's not the what was on the walls or the walls themselves. It was the people that were there. So it's the most precious resource you have. Understanding why they're there and doing what they're doing with you is a key element to being not only a good leader, but also defining your resources. You might find a diamond in the rough. I've many times um, through my engagements with my clients, um, there was just this person that was always fascinated with marketing. And when opportunities were presented with my relationship with the management company that were looking for things to be done, these are the people that showed up with pictures or took pictures or had ideas or what have you. And now these people are in roles that they never envisioned when they first took their first job with the company, but now are doing things that they find fa just fascinating. Social media, marketing, uh, coming up with things that they can do to engage with guests. There's so many talented people that we look at their resource of, of people engagement, and then we see them come alive when they're 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 satisfying i mean i used to talk about the fact that when i was on restaurants and so forth that um it was such a joy an internal joy when somebody enjoyed a good meal at the restaurant uh and had felt good service and they had a magical evening or a magical lunch or whatever it was that they felt really truly happy that they came and enjoyed what we provided service enjoyed the service what have you and then i found that it was a whole bigger world when i got to run hotels and that got expanded to an evening or, or the time that they spend at the hotel or their vacation when I get into resorts and the time that they get to spend in the magic that they had for the days that they were with us. That that warm internal feeling of satisfaction of that, that, that spirit of the servant hospitality thing um, is, is amazing because people in different responsibilities experience that in different ways. I've, I've come to realize that, that the enjoyment I have from what we do from marketing, what have you, in sharing that piece of a puzzle that somebody was missing. So now they see the whole picture that light up in their eyes that says that's now makes sense to me. And I enjoy that because now, now, now I can do what I was struggling to do before. That is a, a, a wonderful thing. And so uh, not to be in the sound of negative that there's walls and walls of discussion about managers. It's not. It's the fact that for those that are wanting to transition from a walls in perspective only to a walls out inclusion, it's, it's inclusion. It's not either or. It's an inclusion. Um, you need to be able to take the, to see the signals. You need to solicit the interest. And if there is no interest and there are no signals, don't push it. Don't make somebody into something because you need them to be that rather than what they're good at and what they enjoy doing and, and, and force them into a situation that they are being set up to fail. 
as I gave you my example, like back in the years, long time ago. So that's it. Um, not a real long show today for this because it is the holidays and uh, everybody has something else to do. And for those who aren't selling these particular, uh, celebrating these particular holidays, they, you have your own celebrations and things. We're coming up on New Year's anyway, which is for most of the world, a consistent place, although there are different New Year's for different uh, societies as well. It is a time of transition for everyone because in spite of whether you do celebrate New Year's on December 31st, for the rest of the world and all the world, calendar-wise, we do transition to 2023. And it's a time where, and I made a joke about this on the last show, either you can't find everybody because everybody's already taking breaks and gap points and taking last of their vacation holidays or anything, and it's hard to get anything done this time of year, or it's a flood of fire hose of everybody trying to get everything done before we run out of time for the end of the year. I find it to be more the latter than the first uh, because we kind of started the year slow, celebrated in the middle, lots of problems in the middle. Then we had some some interesting fall events and so forth. And so we just started kind of kicking into gear some things at the end of this year. And so I found it to be more of a fire hose of, can we get this done before the end of the year? Can this get done now because of this and that, what have you? Um, so I think 2023 is going to come off to a, a beginning of a very busy year for us in the industry. And I don't mean that just from a business of people staying in our resort. I think from a business of doing business, um, what we're doing to keep our businesses running, how we're operating our business, how we're approaching our businesses and our marketing. I think it's going to be very busy first quarter, not necessarily per se in our hotels. I think there's going to be an interesting perspective of how demand and ADR expectations are going to fluctuate. Uh, plenty of forecasting <laughs> prognostications are out there right now. They always start the same. High optimism, followed by a serious realignment of lowering of numbers in the first quarter, followed by another serious realignment of numbers in the second quarter. It's it's for the stockholders to, to entice them into uh, investing, and then the reality of the actual operations come afterwards. Um, so it's always a kind of a Christmas miracle that everybody thinks the world's going to be fantastic in 2023 or the next year, only to have it after the first 90 days get realigned to a different number. So with that, we, of course, will have our live show next week just prior to New Year's. And uh, as a sneak peek announcement, we are trying to get some of the old band back together, um, get some of our speakers that have been with us for over the years, uh, kind of a nostalgic uh, get back together and have a loose open end conversation like we used to years ago. We used to run the show for two, two and a half hours, uh, five or six uh, talking heads and so forth. We're going to try to get some people together for the couple of shows like that in January. So it should be fun to kind of get uh, some new faces on the um, or old faces, I should say, on the show again and kind of open up some conversations, get some banter going. Um, for everyone, again, that is going to take time off between now and the end of the year, I um, wish you all the happiness of ending the year on a happy note. Uh, look forward to our continued discussions going into 2023. And as I said, we have one more show this year anyway, next week. So it's not as if I'm saying goodbye and happy new year now. But I do hope that uh, you all have a very happy and Merry Christmas, a very happy Hanukkah. Uh, and like I said, first of us for the rest of us, tonight's is the airing of grievances followed by tomorrow's evening of red or where the red dinner has to have a red sauce in it. Uh, and then feats of strength. Don't forget your feats of strength for the rest of us. So with that, um, my name is Lauren Gray. I thank you for the privilege of your time and I look forward to talking to you all next week. <laughs>